Welcome back. We are going through our running back rankings here, going through a lot of running backs. Top 36 running backs in Dynasty Fantasy Football. Last week, we tackled the tier list for wide receivers and for quarterbacks, but don't worry, we did not forget about running backs. We're going to go through the positional landscape, kind of who's on the rise, who's on the fall after the season, as well as you know the value that we would expect for some of these guys in a trade, depending on the type of roster that you have. If you have a contending roster, you know you might be wanting to buy some of these guys. If you have a rebuilding roster, you might be wanting to sell off some of these guys. So excited to get into the running back discussion. We don't typically love this position in Dynasty, but it's one of the more fascinating positions out there because of the barren landscape that we have lack of superstar studs that we would have had in 2018, 2019. Yeah. And if you've been following us for a while, you'll know our thoughts on the running back position as a whole and how we like to structure our dynasty teams. Well, uh, we kind of got to pivot at this point, as you guys will see the top of the running back market is really the only sure thing we have for the long term. We start getting into the weeds. We start getting into the 10, the 12, the 15, the 20 plus range. You guys will soon see the type of names we're dealing with. But at this point, that's priority to the top of position like we'll get into. But with that being said, let's waste no more time and let's just get right into it. All right, so we are now into the tier list. Again, we're going to be going through our top 36 dynasty running back rankings. On the left, you guys can see what we have the trade value listed at. You'll see that it's all grayed out from um, the first tier down or whatever. We'll go through these tier by tier, talk about the players, talk about their market value, the appeal that they have. You know, With this position specifically, we need to focus on things like their contract length and how much projectable years of volume that they're going to have because unlike wide receivers it's not so much based on talent we do need to factor in opportunity and situation in the team environment and things like that so you did mention at the beginning of the video that there is three guys that stand head and shoulders across this position and it's Bijan Robinson Jameer Gibbs and Brees Hall and the reason that these guys are so much better than the rest of the dudes is with Bijan and and Gibbs. They were rookies last year. They were first round picks. They got four years more of team control. Plus they could get, you know, franchise tagged or extended by their original teams. They have RB1 uh, production for the next three to four years, which is something that you really can't say about any other fantasy football asset. And then with Brees Hall, he's got two more years left on his rookie deal, but he was a 20 plus point per game running back down the stretch of the season last year. And of course he was an elite prospect coming out. He's tied to Aaron Rodgers going forward. So with these three guys, I mean, you're looking at the cream of the crop of the running back position. We don't love giving up two first rounders for a running back uh, production piece because of the injury prone nature of the position. But given that these guys have such a big advantage over the rest of the position group, I'm actually willing to pay up, especially if your team is in a house money situation coming into its contending window. Yeah, I agree. And if you're looking at underdog big board ADP, uh, early fantasy drafts, sharpest minds over on underdog, you'll see that all three of these guys are currently going within the top 10 picks with Brees Hall having a 6.1 ADP, Bijan Robinson having an 8.5 ADP and Jameer Gibbs having a 10.6 ADP. All these guys being under 23 years old, all these guys representing dual threat ability, all these guys having the opportunity to be the RB1 overall in fantasy combined with the fact that they are all under their rookie deal. So they are the cream of the crop for a reason. They don't have the concerns of maybe being older like a guy like Christian McCaffrey, and they also don't have the production concerns that some of the other young running backs have in that range. Yeah, and I mean, Bijan, I guess, is the biggest projection of this group because he didn't have quite the season that Gibbs and Brees Hall had last year. But of course, we know what the prospect profile was. Arthur Smith is now gone. They have, you know, uh, the first thing Raheem Morris said basically when he took the job was I took this job because of Bijan Robinson and Drake London. So you got to figure coming from that Ram scheme too. We saw what they did with Kyron Williams. We've seen what they've done with Todd Gurley and with Cam Akers even at times too. So they're going to feed their number one guy. Gibbs obviously in a great situation. Brees Hall produced like top five numbers in a horrible situation. His situation is only going to get better here. The next tier down we have listed. I know a lot of people will consider Christian McCaffrey in that top tier. We can't quite get there because you are looking more so on a year over year projection with Christian McCaffrey because, you know, he is 20, going to be 28 years old next year. I'm not going to say that he's going to fall off or he's going to get injured all of a sudden, but he does not have the same value accumulation potential and insulated value to injury that Bijan Gibbs and Brees Hall have. So we have to rank them a little bit lower. But of course, if you're a contending team, there is no better asset to go and acquire than Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, when it comes to Christian McCaffrey, it's pretty simple. From a production standpoint, there's a reason why this guy has the 101 ADP in current early drafts. 
The problem with Christian McCaffrey is that he's 27 years old. He has a lot of wear and tear on his frame. And if he were to go down, even if it's a three week, four week absence at any point within the next couple of seasons, he's prone to his dynasty value cutting in half. Like as soon as he does not produce, uh, let's just say 23, 24 plus points per game, or if he misses some time, we know that he could potentially be in the Rashad White, Kenneth Walker, Saquon Barkley area where, okay, if he's not giving you the production, then he doesn't necessarily have the liquidity that some of these other guys have. So although you would say, well, I would rank Christian McCaffrey over Bijan, over Jameer, over Brees Hall in terms of redraft, in dynasty, we have to take into account just how volatile his market value could be. Yeah, and of course, I'm willing to take that risk for the production if you're a contending team. Like, for example, I traded him to you. You're a contending team. You're probably fine holding him next year and trying to win the championship yet again. These other guys that are in this tier with Christian McCaffrey, we have Jonathan Taylor, uh, Devon Achan, Travis Etienne, and Kyron Williams. Each one of these dudes has their own concerns, has their own positives. With Taylor, with Etienne, you're focusing a little bit more on the profiles that they had coming out of school, the production that they've already put out, in the NFL and with Taylor specifically, he has, you know, that, that uh, contract that he signed last off season with Indianapolis, Travis Etienne, of course, is still a couple of more years of team control as a first round pick with H and with Kyron. They're a little bit more volatile because they're smaller running backs. H and was a third round pick. Kyron was a fifth round pick. So we're not like insulated into them being the guy. They could always add, add players or bring back Mostert or whatever the case is, but the talent level and the production that we did see from them on the field still as young players warrant them being ranked this high. So, How do you dissect this tier? Are you willing to give up a mid to late first rounder if you're like a team coming out of house money window going after a championship next year? Yeah, I would be, especially again, like you said, if you've built up your quarterback position, maybe you have like Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts at quarterback. You have a lot of solidified wide receivers. Maybe it's a start 10 league and you have four or five solid wide receivers, a solidified tight end. Then at that point, if you want to start pouring some picks, pouring some draft capital into the running back position, I'm fine. And for the most part, uh, a lot of drafters have a lot of confidence with these guys going into next year. Kyron Williams having an ADP of 12 in the big board as of now. Jonathan Taylor, 14.7. Devon Achan. 17.3 17.3 and Travis Etienne coming a little bit later at 29.6, but I do think projecting forward, I would consider him in a relatively similar tier to those other guys. Devon Achan, we nec- we haven't necessarily seen it from a full sample size. We obviously saw flashes of him being this elite efficiency back, perfect fit for that Mike McDaniel scheme, but we just saw Raheem Moster post a top five season. He's still under contract next year. We don't necessarily know if he has that overall workload advantage that some of these other guys do. Uh, Travis Etienne, a little bit more inefficient last year. Jags offense really disappointing based on our expectations. Jonathan Taylor, some injury concerns, doesn't catch a lot of pass. Passes. Anthony Richardson may be siphoning some goal line opportunity. And then with Kyron Williams, I mean, I, this is a guy I think can rise a lot, assuming that they don't add competition to the NFL draft. But we're still dealing with Sean McVay. We see this guy cycle running backs literally every single year. And it wouldn't be shocked if they add another running back or if Zach Evans maybe pops off that he can siphon some of that workload. Because with Kyron Williams, he showed the talent. He showed the workload this year. I'm just not necessarily banking on him being this 23, 25 touch per game back every single year moving forward. Yeah, I mean, to play devil's advocate on the Kyron Williams hype train, you could say, oh, you know, NFL teams, when they hit on a guy like this, they want to just use him up and let him hit free agency. But we saw what happened this year with a guy like Damian Pierce. We've seen what happened in years past with guys like James Robinson. Like, in theory, he's an NFL team, and I hit on a guy like Kyron Williams. I'm just going to run him into the ground, let him hit free agency, and move on to the next guy. But we've seen that's not really how these teams actually operate. Sean McVay's, you know, probably one of the best at doing that but we should uh, temper expectations a little bit in case they add some competition. So this year, again, if you're in a contending window and you wanted to go add another running back, I feel comfortable buying these guys now too. Cause I think with running backs, you need to take into account when you're buying them as well. Like you don't want to buy running backs typically this time of year, because a lot can happen from free agency a lot can happen in the draft. But with a guy like Kyron Williams, where we're kind of concerned for stuff like that, it's not a great, draft class for the running back position. I don't anticipate the Rams going out and spending big on a Josh Jacobs or a Saquon Barkley because they have Kyron Williams there in the in the fold. So you might actually get a, a little bit of a discount buying him now as opposed to buying him in August when he's like an early second round, uh, low end first round pick in redraft leagues in the big board. Yeah, he's definitely probably more attainable right now. I don't necessarily think he can necessarily draw uh, jump up to the B. John Gibbs, Brees Hall tier, but could he move up, let's just say, around within a startup? Absolutely. And if that shaves off a second of equatable cost for you, I'm all for it. Because with Kyron Williams, if you're a believer in him, maybe you're a Rams fan and you know about, uh, more about the pulse of whether the team's going to draft a running back or not, that's your advantage. 
Yeah, for sure. So this next tier, I'm just going to like, so it, it's labeled as a late first, early second in terms of overall value. I would label this the tier that like, I would probably want to wait until July yes. or August to actually buy these guys. But I do actually think that there's possibilities for any one of these players to really climb up in value because as we've kind of already teased, this position, there's no, sh there's not a lot of sure things. And a couple of these guys specifically like Rashad White, James Cook and Isaiah Pacheco, because they're younger guys and they haven't been, you know, as pr proven as some of the other dudes, it's possible by mid season next year, we're talking about these guys as solidified top five dynasty running backs with a guy like Rashad White. I mean, I just watched the press conference of our new offensive coordinator. He was very complimentary of his abilities as a pass catcher. I expect Rashad White, even if they do add any competition to the backfield to still be RB one caliber workload with Liam Cohn coming in. Of course, he comes from a Rams scheme. Again, we saw how they use Kyron Williams in years past. Kenneth Walker is the type of guy that everybody's going to undervalue, I think, because Zach Charbonnet is there and it's a new coaching staff. They didn't draft Kenneth Walker. They're probably just going to play the best guy. But I still am kind of buying into the talent of Kenneth Walker, producing at least high-end RB2 or better numbers for the next two to three years. And then he could hit free agency, maybe gets into a new situation. I think Kenneth Walker and Rashad White are two of the more undervalued guys in uh, Dynasty, who I believe are top 10 Dynasty running backs that you might be able to get potentially for like early second rounders or, you know, a late one for Rashad White in a third or, uh, you know, a late one for Kenneth Walker and a young receiver or something like that. Yeah, they're both young guys with juice, uh, with with Rashad White obviously having the pass catching stops, with Kenneth Walker being one of the more explosive runners in the NFL. Both kind of have their merits. Like you said, the risk profile there is maybe the Bucks add a banger, maybe the Seahawks give Charbonnet the ball more. Those are the concerns, but like you said, they can both pay off at a late RB1 type of uh, production value. And for a late first round pick, especially in this type of class where there's not a solidified RB1 at this current point, I think that's a solid process. Let's just say the RB1 goes off the board at 60 overall and you want to move that pick for Kenneth Walker for a Rashad White I'm not fretted about that but that's when I would make that move after the NFL draft after free agency once we kind of know the the situations at hand there if the Bucks don't add competition or if we're hearing good things about Kenneth Walker I really feel like their value could even rise up from here yeah, for sure. Because if you're looking for, you know, just drafting a late first round guy in rookie drafts, there, there doesn't really seem to be one, right? Like we're not going to get a guy that's going the top 50 picks overall in ADP. Daniel Jeremiah doesn't have a single running back listed there. So your best option might be going out and getting a guy like Rashad White on the open market right now. The other two guys, I can just group them together. They're Saquon Barkley and Josh Jacobs, both impending free agents. We don't know if they're going to be back with their current teams. I think if they are back with their current teams on big contracts, we would feel pretty confident projecting them as like low end RB ones and dynasty saying that, you know, they're going to get volume for two to three more years. We know they're both talented players, even though they're a little older, they're not like 30, like they're 25, 26 year old running backs. They should have two to three more years left in the tank. So those two guys I think are also decent low end buys for contenders, depending on where they go in free agency. If it's a bad landing spot, maybe you get a discount. If it's a great landing spot, maybe you're okay paying up for it. And then with James Cook and Isaiah Pacheco, they're kind of just like weaker versions, I guess, of Rashad yeah. White and Kenneth Walker to me. But Pacheco, I mean, monster season this year. James Cook obviously had a great game against the Cowboys, had a couple of big games down the stretch of the season. So those two guys attached to really good offenses should be getting volume. But I would say I'm more concerned about their backfields adding competition than I would be about Rashad White's, for example, because James Cook is a little bit smaller Isaiah Pacheco was a seventh round pick so there's a possibility that those guys could have added competition especially with Pacheco you know Jarek McKinnon and, and CH are both free agents it's possible that they look to the draft to add some pieces there yeah, and uh, real quick, the, so James Cook would kind of be like the comparable for Rashad White, uh, Kenneth Walker to Isaiah Pacheco. Kenneth Walker, Isaiah Pacheco being the explosive runners that don't offer much in terms of the receiving game. And James Cook, despite being in a, a very, very efficient receiver this past year, only four, uh, 54 targets in the 17 games he's played. That's kind of the product of the offense that we saw, uh, more so just Josh Allen being able to create on his own, being uh, used the way he has been, especially in short yard situations, really affected the usage of the running back position. Whereas with Rashad White, I mean, you, you guys gave him seven, eight, nine targets at some points during the year, and that's why he became such a fantasy asset he did because of the workload you guys were giving him. James Cook, not quite that level of workload. Yeah, and I feel confident that Baker is probably going to be back just based on what yeah. I've I've heard from Liam Cohn and you know Todd Bowles and what Baker has said and stuff. It looks like they're going to try and get something done. Um, so we could probably expect a similar situation for Rashad White again. And Baker obviously fed him 
all of those targets this year. So, I mean, I think we're good on this tier. Again, these, these are the yeah. guys that are risky to buy now. If you want to buy them now, that's fine. I would probably try and get them for an early second or an early second round or plus. If you're sending around a first rounder for these guys, just beware that there is some inherent risk that you're that you're dealing with. But it could pay off for you. I think a late first rounder at like 111, 112, you're giving up on like a Troy Franklin or an Xavier Worthy, maybe in a bad landing spot. That's, you know, in terms of startup value, you're getting a top 10 dynasty running back. So you got to, you know, kind of give a little to get a little there. Yeah, 100%. And again, like Corey said, I wouldn't necessarily make a move on any of these guys at this current juncture. The reason being, say the NFL draft happens, both Bo Nix and JJ McCarthy, along with the top three quarterbacks, go in the first round. Maybe we get five or six first round wide receivers. Maybe, you know, Brock Bowers is a top five pick. Like there's a lot that can happen to increase the value of the liquidity that you have in those rookie picks. Whereas with these guys, their value can only go down based off what happens in the NFL draft. So make sure if you are interested in one of these guys and you're willing to make a deal, you prolong it until after the NFL draft because the person that wants the picks is going to want to hurry you and try to get it done right now. Yeah, early second rounders, if you're making the move now, late first rounders after the draft, once you know the landscape, makes a little bit more sense there. Yeah. So um, early to mid second rounders, the next tier that we have listed here. So we do have rookies included here. I don't know if we actually said that yet or not, but uh, Jonathan Brooks and Trey Brent, uh, Benson, to me and to both of us, are like yeah. the best two running backs in this class. But I will say, you know, draft capital and land spot would change a lot about the, how we feel about the top running backs in this class because if let's say Braylon Allen is the first guy off the board goes 50th overall to the Cowboys or something like he is probably RB1 in this class so the top five guys Brooks Benson Braylon Allen Blake Corum and Bucky Irving in my opinion they're kind of fluid whoever has the best draft capital whoever has the best landing spot that's probably going to end up being the guy that goes first in dynasty rookie drafts this year at the like 201 202 type of area and then you have a, a litany of these other guys with Javante Williams, Ramondre Stevenson, Tajay Spears, and then some older guys with David Montgomery, Tony Pollard, and DeAndre Swift. Um, anybody that you want to tackle here? Because there's a lot of individual profiles that we got to go over. You want to start with the rookies? Yeah, so I'll go through the rookies right now. And people might be asking, well, if you view the rookie class as very fluid, why are these guys kind of a tier above the rest? And uh, first, because uh, we think that these are the two best running backs in the class. Second, because they are getting uh, the most buzz out of the entire group as to being top 50 picks, as to being top 64 overall picks, second round picks. We usually see these two being discussed at the top. Jonathan Brooks and Aaron Jones comp. The only real concern he has is in terms of his torn ACL. But if he gets the draft capital, that really gives a good sign to what the NFL feels for that injury. And then with Trey Benson, think of like your Josh Jacobs, your Javante Williams, your tackle breaking machines. I can really see a playoff caliber team like the Cowboys, for instance, being a very good fit for Trey Benson. If he were to land on a team like the Cowboys, given how he plays the game, can really see him have an opportunity to have. 12 rushing touchdowns, 15 rushing touchdowns in the season. Hence why they are above the rest of the running back here. Yeah. Benson I've scouted already and he broke the PFF record for um, yeah. elusive rating in uh, 2022 on a limited workload granted, but he did literally break a tackle on like 50% of his carries, which is an absurd number. Like Javante yes. Williams, Josh Jacobs, perfect type of comparison for the play style there. Ironically, Javante Williams ranked right behind him. Assuming again, of course, these guys get decent draft capital with Javante Williams. I want to rank him in the next year above. I just, I need to see him actually produce at that level. Like he's always kind of been this hypothetically, he could be this RB one, but he hasn't been there yet. Hopefully the Broncos do something to add quarterback talent to add, you know, whatever, because Sean Payton knows how to use Javante Williams and Javante Williams now two years removed from the torn ACL should be better this year. So again, a bit of a projection. If you're looking for a guy that could accumulate some value, I think Javante Williams is a decent bet, but he also has the possibility of people getting really sick of him altogether because we've been waiting for him to produce RB1 numbers and he just hasn't done it yet. Yeah, Javante is a tricky one because obviously we saw the talent profile coming out of college. We saw what he was able to do in his rookie season. And we saw where he was going in fantasy drafts prior to that ACL tear in his second year. This guy was a legitimate mid-second round pick, late second round pick in a lot of your fantasy drafts, ends up suffering that ACL injury, comes back this past year, not quite the same efficiency, not quite the same juice we saw prior to the injury. Hence why are a little bit more pessimistic that can he reclaim that level of juice? Can he reclaim that level of efficiency? That's still a sight to see. I feel like we have to rank him here because if he is able to recover, he's got the opportunity to jump up to the Jonathan Taylor, the Kyron Williams, the Travis Etienne area, because I really do think that prior to the ACL, uh, that prior to the ACL tear, that was the level of talent we were dealing with. 
Yeah, and he's only 24 years old still. So, yeah. I mean, part of the reason why the running back landscape is so bad is because J.K. Dobbins, Javante Williams, and these guys that were supposed to be studs got hurt. So, yeah, we kind of, you know, we, we that uh, re-up of young talent at the running back position, it never happened because these guys never, you know, stayed healthy or whatever. And uh, Javante Williams is the perfect example of that. But again, Sean Payton scheme, get a quarterback in there and he should be good. Ramondre Stevenson uh, is also a guy that I think is a little undervalued on the market right now because the Patriots probably are going to add a quarterback in the draft. They have a similar scheme. It's a similar offense probably that's going to be there. And Ramondre Stevenson was basically a workhorse. I mean, from like week four to like his injury, he was producing low end RB one, mid RB one numbers. So he's the type of guy that I think contenders can get for probably an early to mid second rounder, especially when we're in peak rookie hype season in March and April and May, people are going to want their lad McConkey's their Xavier Leggett's, whoever they're high on in that early to mid second round range. And if you're a, a contender or a future contender looking for a running back production piece, I think Ramondre Stevenson is the type of guy that could absolutely work out. There's a risk that they add somebody, but I still think Stevenson would be the lead back. Even if they add like a day three guy to this backfield. Yep. And then moving on to like a guy like Tajay Spears, a lot, a lot of the question marks here is that we haven't quite seen him handle a full workload before, but Derek Henry basically looks like he's on his way out of the Tennessee Titans, new offensive coaching there with Brian Callanan coming in. And we've seen what the uh, Cincinnati Bengals were able to do there using Chase Brown in efficient situations. Now Chase Brown and Tajay Spears isn't a one for one comparison, but space back that contribute on third downs is what we saw from Chase down uh, Chase Brown and spurts over in Cincinnati really think that Tajay Spears can get that, but uh, at, at a full workload. So if, he's used in those type of situations if he's used as a receiver if he's used as an efficient runner i really like his prospects moving forward hence why he's in this tier i really do think if he's a 250 touch running back we could be looking at the next tony pollard we could be looking at the next aaron jones efficient running back that when thrusted in a bigger workload can really produce an rb1 season now tony pollard now a sour sight, but we were able to see two years ago him be a top eight overall fantasy running back. And if Tajay Spears ever becomes a top eight fantasy running back, you'll be pretty happy investing in early to mid second rounder in that. Yeah. And the last couple guys in this tier, I mean, Montgomery is just a pretty crystal clear projection for like RB2 production next yep. year with the Detroit Lions, with Tony Pollard and DeAndre Swift. I think there's an outside shot that they re sign with their current teams and we get similar production that we got this year, which was like mid RB2 production with Pollard. You kind of hope that maybe he's a little bit healthier and maybe he can produce a higher number from that perspective, but they are both free agents. So we don't know exactly where they're going to end up. I would say Definitely probably don't buy these guys right now. I would kind of wait and see what happens throughout the offseason, where they end up signing, how they're looking in training camp, how they look in the preseason. These are the type of guys I'm okay missing out on um, and not taking that risk. And closer to the beginning of the season, if I needed to buy one of them, I would buy them then. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I would be shocked if Pollard came back to the Cowboys at this point. However, I do think that he should be able to get a starting running back role somewhere. And DeAndre Swift, again, if you're an Eagles fan and you know his situation, whether he's going to come back to the Eagles or not, feel free to leave that in the comments section. But I still think he's a talented player. I still think he has a three-down profile similar to Pollard. And when both are healthy, I really do think that they can contend to be top 15 running backs. Just unfortunately, the long-term nature isn't quite existent with them because they kind of fell out of the good graces of their team's respect. Effectively. Yeah, for sure. So this last tier, I, I really want to explain this before people go yes. down to the comments. So the mid to late seconds tiers that you guys can see here, we have young players that are worth a mid to late second and older players that are worth a mid to late second. So depending on the team that you guys have, the roster that you're looking at, you might value these guys more than others. If you have a contending roster, then Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon, Derrick Henry, Aaron Jones, Nick Chubb, Austin Eckler, and James Conner you're okay giving up a mid to late second rounder for those guys. And you might prefer them over a lot of the rookies in this class, Braylon Allen, Blake Corum, Bucky Irving, or some of the other younger running backs on this list, uh, Zach Charbonnet, Audric Estime, Roshan Johnson. But it's all going to depend where your team is. The reason they're all in the same tier is because they're all worth the same on the open market. But don't go down to the comments and be like, how do you have Alvin Kamara below like Roshan Johnson? It's not like a ranking. That's not how we have it listed here. It's just that they're worth the same, but they're accomplishing two different goals because, you know, we don't usually rebuild around running backs, but if I was going to, I would use a guy like Charbonnet or use a guy like Roshan or use a rookie in this class like Braylon Allen or Blake Corum or Bucky Irving. So whatever your goals are, if you're trying to replenish young talent to your offense uh, on your dynasty team, Braylon Allen, Blake Corum, those type of guys are going to appeal to you. If you're looking to get that RB2 or that RB3 to put your team over the top and help win a championship. Maybe you go after and buy low on a Nick Chubb, or maybe you buy low on an Austin Eckler, or you buy low on Aaron Jones or James Conner, whatever guy that you're going after. So these guys are all worth mid to late second rounders. It just depends where your team is at. 
Yeah, and the way I kind of describe this is if you're trying to compete, those mid to late second round players are gold because you're looking at it right there, especially the aging guys. Like they can give you production and worst case scenario, you know, okay, after the year, they're maybe worth third rounders. You don't really care about downgrading that pick from a mid to late second if it gives you an extra chance at a championship. And for the mid to late second running backs, uh, the young ones, uh, they would be transition pieces where if you can't get liquidity, if you're on the opposite side and you need to tear your team down and you're selling some of those other older running backs, if you can't get an early to mid second round pick and instead you want to bank it on a potential young upside running back moving Alvin Kamara for Najee Harris or moving Joe Mixon for Jack Charbonnet or moving Aaron Jones for Audric Estime would be in your best interest in that regard because you know for the future they have the opportunity to accumulate value whereas the veterans more so serve a purpose for giving you production. Yeah exactly and because the running back position is so weak in the middle class especially a guy like Roshan Johnson Midway through the season, he could end up being a top 12 dynasty running yeah. back. So there's a lot of value accumulation potential with some of these guys. Charbonnet, you know, B-Rob, th those guys are a little bit older. B-Rob, Najee, and Jalen Warren, they're like 25 years old, but they're not quite to the level of like a Camara or a Mixon who are like 27, 28-year-old running backs that are definitely aging assets that are never going to gain any more value. It's kind of just whatever your team needs. What are you looking for? Are you looking for production? Go after a James Conner for a late second round pick. If you're looking for a guy that could potentially gain some value, Roshan Johnson may be worth a late second round pick in your opinion. So again, all these guys are worth mid to late second rounders. There's no real distinction between them. It's really hard to rank these guys without the context of an actual dynasty roster that you're looking at. So definitely um, let us know what you think in the comments. This is our top 36 or so running backs. I'm glad we got through this in a relatively decent amount of time. Um, all these tiers and all the you know quarterback, wide receiver, and tight end rankings are available on flockfantasy.com. When you sign up on Flock Fantasy using promo code FSE, you'll get a seven-day free trial, 30% off. And also, if you sign up annually, you can get six months for free and also a Zoom consultation with one of us to talk about your dynasty rosters, go through your trades, look at your league mates' teams, and talk about trade targets that might be available all that stuff is available to you over on Flock Fantasy. We just dropped our quarterback database for all the rookie quarterbacks, all their you know notable stats, also the top 15 dynasty quarterback stats when they were in college so that you can see you know, how good is Caleb Williams' EPA relative to Trevor Lawrence, who was, you know, the last generational quarterback prospect that we had? How good is Jaden Daniels' rushing numbers relative to Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts, who are the last really good running quarterbacks that we had? So that is all available to you on Flock Fantasy. That will be linked down below in the pinned comment. Tons of other content over there, or articles. We're going to be doing film breakdowns coming in the next couple of weeks on the prospects as well. Our draft guide drops about a week from today. If you guys, uh, when you guys are watching this on Thursday, we'll be live one week from now. So definitely make sure that you are checking out everything we're doing over there. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe. Leave any comments down below. But with that being said, peace out. We'll talk to you soon.